Happy Diwali. <laughs> Diwali, Diwali, sometimes it's also called Deepavali, is the Hindu festival of lights. It's also celebrated by the Sikhs and some sects of Buddhism. Diwali is the biggest and most important holiday of the year in India. The celebration generally spans five days and marks the Hindu New Year. The height of the festival is the third day today. It comes at the end of the harvest cycle and coincides with the new moon, the darkest night of the lunar month. The root word comes from two Sanskrit words, meaning row and lamps or lights. The heart of the tradition is to hang lamps and shine many lights on the darkest night. As in many Christian holidays, the Hindus probably absorb the ancient harvest fe festivals of their culture into this religious celebration. The actual significance and stories of Diwali vary by region and by sect of faith, but the core theme is always the same. It's some version of the triumph of light over dark, of good over evil, or even knowledge over ignorance. Some Hindus associate the festival with the goddess of wealth and prosperity, the beautiful Lakshmi, who visited us today. Some with Ganesh, the beloved elephant-headed blesser of fresh starts and remover of obstacles. And some with Durga, or Kali, the fierce destroyer of ignorance and spiritual oppression. Diwali celebrants often prepare for the holiday for weeks in advance. The festivals are centered around both family and community. Homes are cleaned, they're purified, they're painted, new furnishings are sometimes brought in, and many celebrants begin each of the five days with a ritual anointing bath so that they themselves are clean and pure, and they often dress in their finest clothes. Small gifts and sweets are shared and exchanged. Feasts are prepared with loving care. Many homes, businesses, temples, and shrines will decorate their floors with those bright, colorful Ranguri designs. Maybe you've seen them. They kind of look like the Tibetan sand paintings. They're absolutely beautiful. And everyone hangs special lights and earthen lamps on the third day to brighten the darkness. Some communities host parades that end with blazing displays of fireworks that light up the night skies. It's written in the Hindu scriptures that in the beginning, both the gods, called devas, and the demons, called asuras, were mortal. Like us, they would all eventually die. But, like us, they feared death and wanted to live forever. So they went in search of amrita, the nectar of immortality. And in that search, they set off a great churning of the ocean many precious objects, and even some deities arose from the midst of the ocean's churning. One of the most precious things to arise from the roiling waters was the goddess Lakshmi herself, the daughter of the king of the milky ocean. She arose on the day of the new moon of the Kartik month of the Hindu lunisolar solar calendar, today. On the very night she rose, she was married to Lord Vishnu. Brilliant lamps were lit in endless rows to mark this sacred event. Diwali is said to celebrate both the holy birth and the marriage of Lakshmi. And the lamps are lit to invite her blessings for each new year. Some families recite ritual stories like this one to honor the deities who've triumphed over evil. The purity and light of their homes is a kind of invitation a welcoming of prosperity, of goodness and blessing at the end of a bountiful harvest season on the cusp of the coming darker days. Some traditions have also linked this ritual lighting of the homes with a paying of a deep respect to ancestors, an honoring of those loved ones who have come before. Their souls are welcomed to join in the celebrations and the lights and loud bangs of the fireworks are seen as a kind of send-off at the end of the party. This could actually be another form of a holiday traditionally celebrated in the Christian culture. 
All Saints Day, sometimes known as All Souls Day, which this year is next Saturday. The night before All Souls is known as All Hallows' Eve, popularly celebrated here as Halloween every October 31st. Pagan celebrations predate these holidays by centuries, possibly even millennia, lighting huge bonfires and feasting on apples, nuts, and other sweets were some of the ancient, ancient Britain practices to honor the sun god who brought abundant harvests, but also to offer to honor Samhain, the lord of death, who gathered together all the lost souls who died in the previous year. Our ritual of trick-or-treating, it's actually said to have grown from an ancient English custom of knocking at doors to beg for a soul cake in return for prayers of the dead of the household. The Day of the Dead, Dia de los Muertos, celebrated in Mexico, starts on Halloween and ends with All Saints Day. During this holiday, loved ones who have died are remembered and honored by their family and friends. Celebrations like this can be tracked back to the ancient Aztecs who celebrated their dead a little bit earlier in the year during the harvest season itself. The Aztecs saw death not as an end, but as the start of the cycle of new life. Life and light born out of death and darkness. Across the globe for thousands of years, We've been celebrating the ineffable cycling of light and dark, bounty and loss, life and death, with holiday rituals. Inside these rituals, we use masks and decoration to bring the dark and macabre, even the most fearful images of death, into the light and safety of our homes and communities. We light ritual fires and lamps in the black of night to illuminate what is normally hidden from our sight. As communities, we practice feasting to fill the hollow spaces of loss and shower sweets over the bitter edge of our fears. By greeting the bounty of the harvest season with an honoring of death and loss, by shining light into the growing dark of the new moon and of the colder seasons, we are connecting what seem to be opposing poles of human experience into one single continuum. Unlike the rest of the natural world, we humans have often feared the coming of the dark, and we view death, the ultimate darkness, as an ending, basically something to be avoided at all costs. <laughs> when considered by our young minds, it's pretty much just common sense to keep the light on at night and to believe that death might come to others, but never to us. But some deeper part of us holds a very different view. The ancient part of us, the part that is powerfully tied to the earth, that recognizes our place in the whole, that part has always been driven to create ritual and celebration to honor the inherently cyclical nature of this world, of what we are. We may think of ourselves as having progressed beyond the pagan celebrations of our ancestors. We may view modern fall holidays as something fun, an opportunity to eat some great stuff, maybe to dress up if you're into that. <laughs> um, maybe for some of us, it's just an annual annoyance. But our roots, they still distantly call to us through these primal rituals. In the world of nature, Summer bounty bows under the falling leaves of autumn. And the fall harvest bows under the punishing cold of winter. Winter gives way to the liquid rush of spring and spring greens ripen into summer fruits and flowers. Day fades into night and night into day. Death fades into decay and that forms the loamy matrix that spawns new life. Plant death feeds animal life. Animal death feeds plant life. If you remove the human lens of duality, light and dark are not separate at all. 
Light and dark, bounty and loss, life and death, are just different halves of the whole. If we cling to one and reject the other, we instinctively feel out of balance. If we take the example of nature's wholeness, if we strive to be whole in ourselves, we can embrace the apparent opposites, celebrating the light even as we honor the dark, and in doing that, somehow transcend them both. I'll leave you with a poem by one of my favorite contemporary nature mystics, Mary Oliver. It's called The Ponds. Every year the lilies are so perfect, I can hardly believe they're lapped light. They crowd the black midsummer ponds. Nobody could count all of them. The muskrats swimming among the pads and the grasses can reach out their muscular arms and touch only so many. They are that rife and wild. But what in this world is perfect? I bend closer and see how this one is clearly lopsided, and that one wears an orange blight, and this one is a glossy cheek half nibbled away, and that one is a slumped purse full of its own unstoppable decay. Still, what I want in my life is to be willing to be dazzled, to cast aside the weight of facts, and maybe even to float a little above this difficult world. I want to believe I'm looking into the bright white fire of a great mystery. I want to believe that the imperfections are nothing, that the light is everything, that it is more than the sum of each flawed blossom rising and fading. And I do.